Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm looking at my notes here, and I don't have my reading glasses, and the font looks horribly small. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody, to the 27th annual Elizabeth Bennett Reading. My name is Noelle Doherty, and I'm head of the upper school. The Bennett Reading Grant is granted each year to one faculty member to fund a two-year writing project. Recipients demonstrate a reverence for the written word and seek to share that passion with students and colleagues. Candidates are selected through an application process that includes detailed plans for their course of study um, and written samples. Tonight we will share in the work of Rachel Applebaum as she completes her second year as a grant recipient, and we will hear from the first year recipient, Darlene Earls. The readings began in 1995, but the award has been in existence for the past 37 years since 1984. Elizabeth Bennett was a respected English teacher who taught at Kingswood School from 1936 to 67. She is remembered by her students as having an intense and devoted interest in the use of the English language and for her remarkable ability to inspire a precise and disciplined use of words in the written expression of thoughts and ideas and also for her love of poetry. As a former student describes Miss Bennett, quote, an eyebrow raised just a fraction of a millimeter created the barest ripple of a wrinkle once enough was enough to let me know that I had passed matters far enough. I would pursue the line of reasoning no further. From that moment, I stepped in, from the moment I stepped into her classroom, I felt her intense dedication to truth and excellence. Her examples to her students was one of quiet appreciation and in pursuit of all of the best. In class, we analyzed sonnets by Shakespeare, Browning, we read Hamlet, Macbeth, novels by Jane Austen. She didn't lecture to us about great literature. She showed us how to analyze it. She gave us tools to use uh, that sharpened our minds and converted our hearts. She expected that we would think deeply and well and, imagined, uh, and use our imagination beyond our years. And so we did, end of quote. We're grateful for Ms. Bennett, who helped set a foundation of care and dedication to the written word that resonates with us today. We are also grateful to her former students, who chose to honor her by establishing the Elizabeth Bennett Writing Grant. We thank Carolyn Cross Chinlin and Annie Sanders from the Kingswood class of 1958, and Leslie Johnson, class of 64, for their continued work on the grant, and to all of the Friends of the Bennetts, for their, dis for their contributions to the fund and for making this evening possible. It is exciting to be able to welcome a live audience back to the Bennett Readings. Coming together as a community to celebrate and share in the talents of our colleagues, it's an important touchstone in all of our lives. The reading events inspire us. Doing a public reading of one's work is by all accounts both exhilarating and daunting. And we often have former Bennett recipients who come to provide moral support. Do we have any former Bennett recipients in the audience? Please stand. Come on, stand up. Yay! <laughs> now for the introduction of our first reader. Given Miss Bennett's love of poetry and her ability to nurture and, uh, and establish appreciation in her students, I know she would enjoy hearing from tonight's first reader, Rachel Applebaum. Tonight, Rachel's remarks uh, marks tonight. Sorry, tonight marks Rachel's second reading as a Bennett Grant recipient, a teacher in the English department and yearbook advisor. Rachel's professional career has been defined by her cultivation of student creativity. Her colleague, Anna Green, points out that Rachel begins each class with a topical daily write. Her classroom, exhibits subtle, uh, her classroom habits subtly impressed upon her students the importance of personal writing and creative output as a necessary underpinning of intellectual and academic growth. A 
appropriately then, the Bennett Grant has carved out the same kind of opportunities that Rachel so conscientiously provides for her ninth and 10th graders, graders, an invitation to introspection, an empowerment of her written voice, and a community ready to receive and support her artistry. Last year, when Rachel officially began her time as a Bennett Grant recipient, she intended to revise a collection of fragmented short stories. However, she increasingly found herself attracted to poetry. Its, um, its ambiguous language, its frequent sense of irresolution, and its ability to orchestrate thematic, epico the thematic, the thema excuse me, and its ability to orchestrate themes across concrete works. At the end of her first year, Rachel shared with us a suite of poems offering clear-eyed, eloquent reflections on the delicate state and feelings of being connected, of being in between youth and adulthood, parent and child, nostalgia and change. Over the course of the second year of writing, Rachel has continued to hone her work through courses with Writers.com and the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis. Alongside these classes, Rachel has begun reading more widely in the memoir genre, recognizing its important intersections with poetry. In the coming months, Rachel plans to share her work beyond the Cranbrook community as she seeks publication venues for her work. Some of these we will hear tonight as she shares some of her newest poems. It is with pleasure that I welcome up Rachel Applebaum. Thank you, Noelle. I feel very lucky to take part in two distinctly unique Bennett readings. Last year, although it was an intimate experience being in a beautiful library with only a handful of others, it was, and it was amazing that the live stream could reach so many, especially those who would not be able to attend otherwise. So now being here in this much bigger, um, art museum um, auditorium, this feels even more cozy in some aspects. First, I wanna say thank you to my colleagues in the English department. I'm so happy to be back in the workroom with you. Thank you to my dear friends with whom I share a love of words and stories. Thank you to my family, my dad especially. You're still very cool. That's a nod to last year. <laughs> and thank you to my fiance, Jordan, for your endless love and support. Last year, I read about 10 poems just in succession. This year, I'm going to read seven, but I also want to provide some insight into my process and sources of inspiration. So please bear with me as I transition from one to the next, maybe a little awkwardly. But when I was reading through these seven, I hadn't initially thought that there was any kind of running theme or motif, but the more I read through them and, and organized them, I realized that despite how different each might feel to me, each one is about finding or trying to find pockets of love and peace in mess and noise. This was a tough year for my writing, so I really treasure these poems for giving me that piece. So there's a little visual aids for some of them. So the first couple of poems I'm going to read are ekphrastic style poems, which is um, poetry that responds to visual art. So this first piece is called Over Vitebsk by the painter Marc Chagall. I am not an art historian but when there are artists or specific pieces that I really like, I kind of become obsessed and I try to learn everything I can about them. I first learned who Marc Chagall was when I was 18 and I read a novel called The World to Come by Dara Horn, which features Chagall and this piece specifically. So it's just become one of my favorites. And this piece over Vitebsk is a play on a Yiddish phrase. I'm not gonna say it in Yiddish, 
but it is a reference to beggars that walk from, that go from house to house. And the phrase describes them as walking over the houses. So that's how he portrayed this man sort of walking through the sky. And it's another reason I love Chagall so much is he, he, his use of color, but his use of whimsical and fantastical imagery, even of ordinary moments. Um, I just love that. So this is the one poem. Last year I ended my set with a poem that was not from my perspective. It was me telling a story. So this year I'm going to start with that. Winter Mornings. The grass is indeed greener across the street. The lamppost peeks curiously into the windows of the house I don't own. Winter punishes my house half hidden from the light, chilling the floor to its bones, silencing the hearth to frost. My headstone family is warmer in their bed of snow. Unable to sleep, unwilling to go, I circle the town until sunrise steers me home. The giant has begun his rounds for bread and milk. Imminently, he will knock for me. This next one, it's another ekphrastic poem. This one is much more personal to me. This is a, a painting by um, Pierre-Auguste Renoir called Two Sisters on the Terrace. Um, I don't know much about Renoir, the artist, but I really do love the Impressionist movement especially for the color you see here and the ability to just depict natural light in a painting. Um, I, I really like both Renoir and Chagall actually for their use of color and the infusion of just joy into their pieces, even though they may not look exactly the same. And with this piece in particular, I've seen it in the Art Institute of Chicago more than one occasion, but the last time I was there in 2018, Five years before that, my half-sister had been born. And even though I'd seen this piece before and liked it, suddenly, because I had a sister, the painting Two Sisters just suddenly was like a steel cable connection, and I just felt very possessive of it. Um, I just see me and my sister in it. I think even the colorings of hair and eyes are, are similar. So... This is for her. At my shoulder, for C. They weren't really sisters, Renoir's models. A lovely portrait to be appreciated by anyone all the same. Then you were born and grew in front of my eyes. Two sisters, there we are. I wish I could tell you, sister, that life is a spring day on the terrace, but we won't always live in radiance. Sometimes life is a monochrome winter inside. Sometimes we live in masks. Take heart that our figures are fixed, weathering together as sisters. Little golden sister, perceptive lamb, you contradiction. The world is your basket of thread to seize with both hands, yours for the stitching. I want to unpeel your little fingers, chide you, not yet. But I lean back, hands folded. Is that love for a sister? Renoir didn't choose us to be his models. But when I sit, come stand at my shoulder. Behold, there we always were, two sisters. And then this last image I'm going to show is by no means a work of masterful art, um, but it's a photo that I took on my phone. Um, not a particularly great photo, I'm not, but what I was trying to do was capture this unexpected moment um, that I had, I was just out for a walk with my dog and 
it wasn't even a particularly unique sunrise, but for whatever reason, it just floored me. And you know, I imagine that that happens from time to time where we have an experience that's profound for us and we can't quite explain why or maybe any other time we wouldn't feel the way we do. So I tried to preserve it and this poem is an attempt to explain that feeling. Seven twenty-eight a.m. Yes, the pastel colors of a sunrise are more beautiful than any other palette. It's easy to see there is magic in the minutes when the moon alights atop a bed of dawn. Here is a greater miracle. I am awake. The sky looks like something I would paint, amateurish and enthusiastic. Peaches and lavenders tinged with gray, as if I knocked a bottle of black ink over, droplets scattered and smeared uninvited. Yet even as this fog smothers the morning's energy, I find myself in tears on an ordinary Friday. I have missed so many sunrises. So this next one is not inspired by a beautiful painting, but a series of spam calls that I got on my phone one week, one random week this summer. Um, I know it's common that we get these phone calls that are from just random cities and random states, and they're just spoofs or whatever the term is, but um, I got a bunch from the same city in rapid succession. And I just became so curious about the place that I looked it up on Google Maps and I was zooming in on the buildings and looking at the streets. Um, and what it made me think about is this common trope in books and film where someone gets the unexpected call and it's the, you know, sets them on a new trajectory or a journey. Uh, so I decided to imagine that these calls were my own call to um, a new life, a new, you know, a call to adventure. Six times the charm. Upper Marlboro, Maryland has called five times in four days, though I don't know anyone in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Clearly, signs are found not only in the earth, but in ourselves. A calling can be answered literally. Five times I don't answer. Curiosity prevails, and I scour the map. What kind of town summons a stranger home? I imagine that home lies near Schoolhouse Pond, and I stroll the perimeter on my way to Main Street Coffee and Treats to sit among the chatter and the gossip. I hope Lido Pizza is better than the Domino's across the street for nights when I don't want to cook. I wonder what the students of Prince George's public schools are reading these days. And if I should enter the gingerbread house contest at Darnell's Chance House Museum. These names are still dots on a map, marbles in my mouth, not yet memory. I am still waiting for Upper Marlboro, Maryland to call again with further instruction. I can be patient. I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna, uh, for this next one, I'm gonna give some context after I read. Why you stopped straightening your hair. Trichotillomania, a compulsive desire to pull out one's hair. Her makeshift salon was the bedroom floor. Every night, Seated crisscross behind you, your mother wove her nimble fingers through your fine, frizzy strands. Gently nudged your younger head down as she smoothed and styled, hair dryer for speed, flat iron for polish. Until your hair was glossy, perfectly straight, bald patch covered by an expert part. You returned to your room and tried not to pull it all out. You huff in front of the mirror every morning, fail to force your flyaways into submission, shove at strands that refuse to obey, 
Your hands are heavy and unkind, not a salon, but a siege. Bald spot gone, but ends fray. Part grows wider with every swipe of ceramic heat. Every pull of the iron is frustration, distaste, and damage. The ritual is nothing like those nights with her cuddled on the bedroom floor. You miss her hands, not the hiss of singed ears. The first day you leave your waves wild. You wait for lightning that doesn't strike. You brace to scowl at your reflection. You sigh with relief instead. You sip your coffee slowly now with your disentangled minutes. You see your mother standing behind you, those same tender fingers twirling your curls, this time nudging your head towards the sky. I'd originally written this one in the first person using the I pronouns, um, and then I decided to change it to the second person because this one was always, I knew I wanted to write about this, but it's combining a lot into one piece, you know, uh, my hair journey, uh, family relationships, and a lot that is um, sources of frustration and have been. And so writing in the second person is both kind of an allusion to, like, you know, I'm looking in the mirror in this piece, and there's that sort of separation of self when you're looking at your reflection, you kind of distance, um, and writing about this in a way that distanced the subject matter for me, just, it was almost like me letting things go a little bit as well, um, which is what I was trying to do in the act of, um, you know, how I, how I um, treated my hair, um, which, and I think that was just so fascinating that the change of a pronoun, the change in, you know, just a shift in point of view can do so much there. These final two, um, they're my shortest ones. These are when I'm trying to play with short form, which is um, scary, but I love, you know, it's, it's you know, about... <laughs> choosing the right words and cutting, cutting, cutting. I mean, sort of no wonder that I, I um, never finish those stories. You know, I'm, I'm always looking to cut words rather than add them. Um, but I, I'm gonna kind of touch on these two together and then just read them one after the other and that'll be how I close. This first poem that I'm gonna read describes a real moment I had recently where I was driving down Woodward Avenue and I saw kind of sheltered in the trees, a coyote. Um, and I had been experiencing a lot of writer's block this summer. Um, and this whole last year was hard on everyone. And August was a tough month. And I was just feeling like I had nothing to say, nothing to say. And I just saw that coyote. And these lines and words just started popping into my head. And I was sitting in the parking lot of where I was, where I ended up, and just scribbling frantically um, my notebook. And ah, oh, the relief I felt of just when it comes to you. And then the last one I'm going to read, kind of the um, converse of that, is this one kind of came to me almost fully formed. I really made minimal edits to it, which doesn't normally happen, um, but was a, um, one of the smoothest writing experiences I'd had. But I think both of these poems in different ways uh, touch on this idea of the way we physically want to respond sometimes to emotionally taxing times. Coyote. The coyote stood under the trees along a busy intersection. I was driving to therapy to talk of death and petty gripes when I saw the stolid silhouette. Suddenly, I wanted to abandon the voyage, the car, door ajar, kick off my shoes, feel the pavement, and follow him for a while. I want permission to surrender to my uncultivated instincts, not talk, but howl. And this is my final piece for tonight. A break. There are moments, occasionally, every so often, 
when I want to lie down in the middle of the hallway on linoleum chalky with footprint or carpet stained and rough, any surface is inviting as warm laundry. I want to curl my body like a tabby whose only job is to find the sunbeam. It's okay, I'd say, should anyone ask. Walk around me, give me five minutes, I'll get up. Moments, like hallways, are made to pass. Thank you. <laughs> That last poem makes me want to take a nap right now. <laughs> so I'll give me just a few minutes. Oh, I can take this off, sorry. <clears throat> um, I'm Jacob Hazard, I'm the Dean of Faculty, and it's my responsibility to see that faculty members are aware of the Bennett Writing Grant opportunity. And it's always gratifying to see this unique opportunity come to fruition. Our next reader, first year grant recipient, Darlene Earls, is a familiar face on campus. While it is just her second year as a full-time artist in residence, Darlene has long been a trusted partner in our art department, taking over the helm in several studios sabbatical, during sabbaticals and more. She has spent time teaching in every one of our studios and currently inspires our sculpture and digital photography students. She's a trained artist and jewelry designer and also a vibrant, with a vibrant studio practice. Along with her husband, Elliot Earls, designer in residence and head of the 2D art design, uh, department at Cranbrook Academy of Art since 2001. She and her children are an important part of the Art Academy community. Her son Harris is a current freshman at CK. Darlene's fellow artist in residence, Lynn Bennett Carpenter, does a great job of capturing the essence of Darlene. As Lynn puts it, once you spend any time with Darlene Earls, you know not only the cadence of her voice that is recognizable across a crowded room, but you also know her manner of expression, quick, witty, over the top, sharp. She has you hanging by a thread as she twists, tangles it, and turns it with punctuation knots. She leaves you gasping, oh my God, where is this going? Then Darlene delivers the punch. <laughs> so it is no surprise that this highly trained artist with her many artistic skills that translates human experience and voice into material is able to compose with words too. An artist does her best work with honesty and devotion to the craft of her voice. The principles are often the same in the visual world as in the writing world. A talent that is given devotion of hours of practice, skill building, and eventual mastery. Darlene as a writer is not much different than Darlene as a metalsmith. The same pro pro process of honing a craft Artists are artists because they can do many things, including breaking conventions in the best possible of ways and surprise you. Darlene is really good at that, the surprise. Join me in welcoming Bennett Grant recipient, Darlene Earls. So now I'm going to bore you to tears. a prop comic. So let me get this out for you. This is my journey. This is like a box that my mother sent me full of my childhood memories. And I thought I'd just kind of unfold them, a couple of them for you. So you can see, oh, so this is how she came from being a visual artist into being a writer. Because it didn't just happen one day, except for the day that Jordan read his, um, his uh, ben Bennett reading, and then I went, wait a minute, there is something inside of me that wants to come out. So, inspiration. Keep it short, because this is short. All right, let me turn this way. It might be more impressive, but, or not.
it over. Don't make two with the podium as is. Okay, so when I was preparing, I did a pre-read because I thought I need to explain to everyone how this happened from that. Um, okay, so and I call it pre-read, but words and stories, they've been with me forever. Uh, since I was young, my inner natural dialogue was always spinning yarns, trying to make sense of what was going on around me. Um, the question that kept going through my head was, what is going on here? I would look at people and I would think, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Where did they come from? What is their story? Why are they talking to me? So when I was young, I'd say about nine or 10, I can remember one pivotal moment that happened to me. My mom said to me, I was telling a tale, and she said, Dee Dee, which is what she called me, Dee Dee, now, is that a story? And I looked at her and I said, yes, yes, it's a tale, it's a story, but it feels so true. So then I felt a little bit funny about telling her, telling other people these tales and these stories. So I started writing in third grade, which is weird, I know, but this is the start of my writing. All these little books, all these books filled, filled. My mother sent me five of these boxes filled with writing, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. I just put them in box after box after box and hid them under my bed. Then in middle school, I read John Steinbeck's The Red Pony, and I couldn't believe how beautifully tossed I was. I mean, it was like magic, something happened to me. I was like awakened in a visual world. The characters, the scenery, the story, they were so real to me. I mean, it was real. I met Billy Buck. I can tell you right now, I know how tall he is. I know what hat he wore. I know what kind of jeans he wore. I know how he walked. I know everything about Billy Buck. He was alive. He may not be in flesh, but his spirit was alive. His character was alive to me. Then in college, I decided I'm gonna be a visual artist. So they gave me, graduated me to the big book, the sketchbook. So I started writing and drawing, but the writing was still in there. But I was, went from this format to this format. I have way too many of these also. But I know I'm a visual artist. I paint, I sculpt, I create things, metal things, felt things, clay things, wood things. I make things. But all my stories are hidden inside the work. I wove, sewed, burned, scratched, etched, stamped the writing in all of my visual work. But it was hidden. But it supported the work. It coexisted with the visual things. Like this locket. This is a story about two of my dogs who I watched enter the world and exit the world and their story with me. And this is a box that opens and shuts. And outside, it's about coming to being middle age and being a mom and realizing that the last 15 years were of folding laundry and vacuuming and making beds and making box lunches. So I took all the little notes that I wrote my kids and all the little notes they wrote me back and I shoved them inside of my container. This, this work is about being a middle-aged mom. This is what visually came out of it. 
So, and if you've been in my, my house, I have this bright orange bathroom, and in there I have a sculpture called the Red Pony, and it's about another dog of mine. And it has a hinged door and a drawer, and inside is a picture of my golden retriever, yet another dog, and a little story about how we became best friends. But the writing and one character pushed out and away. It's a little emotional, but um, her name is Sun. And this is her journey. She has about 30,000 words so far, and she's fighting for more of my time. And she wants to be on a page and not to be in a box. So these are my three, uh, my three chapters, so bear with me. <laughs> and I hope they're not boring, but, and I hope, I don't know, I can just go along for the ride. Um, the first one, is called $20. My bike was purple, yellow, and rust. Tammy and I called it the beast, mostly because it weighed as much as a truck. I loved the beast more than I loved anything except my dog pony and my mama. I had, it, ha it had white plastic wicker basket with faded plastic sharp flowers stapled to the front. The seat was a classic banana with flower power flowers in pink, orange, and blue. Tammy and I could both fit on the seat. Her feet would drag on the downhill because she was afraid of crashing. I would scream for her to lift her feet while smiling deep in my heart. We would push past, we would push that heavy beast to the top of the hill by the university and coast down King Hill toward her house and where my blood dad worked. If we had great speed, we could coast past Small's garage and end up in front of Kurt Wolf's house. He was my age and he was in my grade and he was completely lovable. <laughs> Every time I saw a bale of hay on a truck, I would secretly say this rhyme, hey, hey, look away. And then I would wish, I will marry Kurt Wolf. <laughs> if you make a wish, then you want the hay truck to be gone. If you peek back and it's still there, your dream will never come true. So the idea is to want your dream so bad, you can stop yourself from peeking. It's called wish discipline. <laughs> Only dreams of the true of heart will come true. And I tell you, those hay trucks move so darn slow. They're almost as slow as peach trucks. On this hot afternoon, Tammy and I huffed to the top of the hill. And looking down the hill at the garage, she said, Ain't it something? Your blood dad buying Mr. Small's garage? and the house. The words, they socked me in my stomach. I almost couldn't find air. I guess I thought it was okay that my blood dad had nothing to do with me because we were all poor and struggling and, and busy making a life. I just thought he didn't care about anything. That's why he didn't care about me. But he did care about something. And I felt stomped on and my lungs could not find air. I was thinking he had no he had no choice about caring. Like Pops had no choice about drinking and Burn had no choice about losing all of his jobs. My heart was thumping so hard. I had to put the bike down and sit on the sandy curb. I felt her hand smooth out my sweaty shirt. Son, I thought you knew that. Tammy wasn't one for hurting anyone. She was kind, but she couldn't take back the words. The truth was out there to look at. I'm okay. I'm just winded. It's the hill. This will be our last run. I'm getting tired. We mounted the beast, but I didn't pump the pedals much, and our speed was adrift. 
We passed Tom, Tammy's house, and her dog, Boom, barked and chased us along the lawn edge, and we stopped in front of Small's garage. She slid off the banana seat and started toward her house, and I could hear her talking to Boom. I just straddled the bike, looking at my blood dad. A cigarette was hanging from his mouth, and he was moving a tire from the front of the garage to the side. He dropped the tire and squinted over at me while smoke moved around his head. I was frozen still and my arms and legs filled with weight. I wanted to move, but I couldn't. And then he moved toward me slowly and he put the cigarette out with him hooch and bent over and picked up the butt. He was neatly dressed and his hair was combed tight to his head he was now walking over to me, and I stopped breathing. He came close and said, What do you want? I couldn't move any muscle in my body. My head started to feel fuzzy. I looked up at his frowning, handsome face. You want money, right? The word money sh shook me. I think I shook my head no. I gasped for air. He reached in his front pocket and pulled out a $20 bill and held it out for me. Well, take it. I just stood there crooked and tortured by the situation. The word money and a bill moving in the wind blocked me even stiller. He shuffled closer, kind of sideways, like I would bite him, and he held the bill closer to my face. Take it. I blinked and he tossed it into the white whisker, wicker basket and walked toward the shop. He was speaking toward the shop, but I heard him say, they always want something, always come around for something. When he got close to the door, Heidi, the German shepherd, popped up and moved under his hand. He moved his hand gently over the scruff of her neck and head. That a girl, he said and he was gone. I moved my finger, fingers over the handlebars and sat back on the banana seat and then turned and looked at Tammy's house. She was standing in the grass, looking like she saw something she shouldn't have. I held in the confusion till I was halfway home, and then I let the wind sting my eyes and film me. That $20 bill sickened me because I did need it for my mama's shoe fund, but I couldn't bring myself to touch it. The next Sunday, Darla Jo came to pick me up for church, and she said she found a $20 bill next to the door, and she whispered in my re ear real soft, put that in your mama's stash. She needs it for shoes, sugar. So I pointed to the jar behind the canned pickles, and she pushed it in. The next chapter is called Praying for Teeth. Sundays, I don't pray. I try not to say one thing to God on Sundays. Although when I'm sitting next to Darla Jo in the Holy Baptist Church, I move my mouth so she thinks I'm praying. I usually just say the song Old MacDonald. <laughs> Dar Darla Jo always looks at my lips and then she smiles and pats my leg she encourages the prayer i know the lord is overloaded with people talking to him on sunday so i talk to him on regular days i think it's the best i think the best part of the day to talk to god is mid-morning at school it's not during everyone's morning coffee or when they're stuck in traffic those are the crowded prayer hours. So I go to the bathroom and put some of that brown, stiff paper towel on the floor and then kneel right down in the corner and pray to God the Father. I tell him all the wonderful stuff in my life because everyone likes to hear good stuff. I tell him that Mr. B and Mrs. B are beautiful and they love me and are the best kind of people. And I tell them all about my critters, especially my dog, Pony. My heart swells when I talk about him. I love our critters. 
even though it takes me over an hour to feed and water them all. Darla Jo needs a baby, but I'm glad I'm her baby right now. Then I tell them how wonderful my mama is. She's kind, and she needs a hug. And I tell them that she's the light of my life, and when she smiles, and when she cooks, I'm lucky to be with her. I pray I'm enough for her and that she can feel my love. I always ask him to keep her safe. I know this is very selfish because I'm kind of praying for a gift for me. And I wonder if he knows it's a gift for me. Then I pray straight out for the big wish. I want beautiful teeth. <laughs> because everyone with a good life has good teeth. I'm not sure they're good people. I just know they had a shot at a good life because they had good, straight, white teeth. <clears throat> I promise to brush and floss, which I do without being told. And then I also pray not to be alone or lonely when I grow up. I want a husband like Mr. B. Mr. B loves Mrs. B. His eyes twink twinkle when she's around. They've been married forever and he still thinks she's the most beautiful person he's ever seen. And he loves her cooking, and he tells me her food is the best on earth. Even that Pepperidge Farm frozen cake she pulls out. It's delicious. They go out in the sailboat together, and I see them hold hands. And he opens the door for her and calls her sweetness. And they even kiss goodbye when she goes to see her sister Wanda. I know it's a lot to ask for. I don't want to be a movie star or anything big or wonderful. I just want a small kind of wonderful with enough for me and my sweetness to maybe drive to the beach in our car. I would like that. Then I blow a kiss up to God the Father and thank him for all I have. I know I'm truly blessed. I know this and I feel just terrible asking for more. So I understand if it, if it don't happen. Then I say amen which is goodbye and thank you in Bible language. And I put the shield of the cross on my body, and I take the invisible soul from my heart, and I hide it in my calf behind the shin bone so the devil can't find it. Okay, my third chapter. These are, like, not in any really order. I just, these are the ones I was working on. This is called Slurpy Birthday. Tammy, my best friend, she called me early and said she was bored and was fandangling a plan to get some fun. She loved that word. I knew she was scheming. She said, just be ready. So when she appeared on my step with a paper coupon that she created for a Slurpee from the 7-Eleven pump and dunk, I was not surprised. But I was apprehensive and uneasy about participating in the master lie. <laughs> this coupon was for my fake 12th birthday. We both loved red Slurpees. We didn't drink them much because her dad said they were disgusting, even though he drank them with us. <laughs> Sometimes in summer, he would drive us to the 7-Eleven on Diggsville Street, and we would sit back in the we would sit in the back of his big truck and drink them red slushy Slurpees. He drove us way over to the other side of town and said it was a secret and not to tell Tammy's mom. I'm sure Tammy's lips and red tongue gave the secret away. Mr. Settle liked that kind of that part of town. He grew up there with a bunch of his friends and still that still had cottages and lake houses. It was a beautiful drive to the big lake. It was festive and felt like we were going on vacation. You could see boats and campers and the hum of cicadas filled the air. The, the pump and dunk had fish and lures and night crawlers and every snack and drink you could think of. Mr. Settle loved searching the wall of colorful ornaments and flashy metal spinners. He would inspect the lures and the flies at the counter while he talked to his buddy Teak. Tammy and I sat in the back of the pickup, sucking on that wide straw in folding lawn chairs. Our heads would split with pain while we sucked that thick frozen dream. We took turns rolling around on a piece of cut carpet, 
on the bed of the truck trying to thaw out our thoughts. Tammy told her dad it was my birthday, and she made me that elaborate coupon to prove it. It was not my birthday, and I'm pretty sure he knew it. I bet he was hankering for a Slurpee and a fishing story from Teak. I just swallowed hard when she knocked on the door and drew out the plan. She only opened the door a bit and leaned in and said hi to my mama. Then she told me to slip on a dress real quick. She was real sneaky in a positive, no one's going to get hurt kind of way. <laughs> now go get a dress on, she pushed me toward my room. She told my mama we were where we were going real slow so my mama wouldn't go talk to her dad. My mama was busy getting ready for work at the retirement house and she paid Tammy no mind at all. My mama put a can of soup out for me and kept straightening the kitchen. I'm sure she was happy. I wouldn't be by myself tonight. It was a relief to her. She hated leaving me alone. When I walked toward the truck with the sundress over my t-shirt and shorts, Mr. Settle kind of snickered at the whole plan. Mr. Settle was very strict and controlling, so it was nice to see him smile. Maybe he just needed a break from himself. It was times like this that I would think, I wasn't so bad, and maybe I had some good to offer Tammy. The three of us were happy in this moment. There was some kind of concert happening near the lake, and you could hear the music and the people clapping. Tammy and I thought this might set her dad off. He hated crowds and he hated people, but he was still happy, so we relaxed a bit. Tammy squeezed my hand when he started thumping the steering wheel to the low thud of the music, but then we knew he, he wasn't going to blow his top. There were plenty of people at the pump and dump filling, coolers and ice with ice and beer. Most of the people were sunburned and groggy and gearing up for the last part of the day. Tammy and I watched, mostly without talking, but occasionally a couple would make us laugh. The voice made us kind of invisible. She was kind of boy crazy, or what she would say, I'm just boy interested. So, she would say, so, what do you think he sees in her? It was always obvious. Her short shorts, her bikini top, her beautiful tan, her not so tan areas. I would just roll my eyes. But it was nice being here with her. She always had plans and ideas. She took a sip of that Slurpee and said, I probably won't get married. I don't want kids. I want to live far away from here and do something fun, like be a travel agent or work on the airline, being a stewardess. I want to see different places. My words staggered out of my mouth. Yup, not here. You can come with me. We could do it together. Panic set in me like a flash of lightning. I could never leave my mama. What would my mama do? Well, she could be free. She could be free, Tammy said out of the side of her mouth. Her eyes drifted up to mine and she knew she'd wounded me. The thought was pulling me under. My mama could be free if I was gone. She could stop working so hard, find a real life and not have a make-do life. She could get good stuff. And then Tammy touched my hand holding the giant Slurpee and her face went dark and still. And then I saw that my blood dad's truck had pulled in and was set for getting gas. His drunk girl was sliding her flip-flops on the ground toward the bathroom. And my blood dad watched her scoot and then reached over and adjusted the cooler just right and then wiped a smudge off of the mirror. He'd been drinking, you could see, by the way he was moving next to the pump. Tammy whispered, oh, brother, and then looked down at the carpet. A bunch of wild kids yelling a song on a radio pulled in next to him. He was not amused. 
And then I called. It caught his eye, and he yelled over, Booger! A car full of kids looked at me, and I dropped my gaze to the Slurpee. Please don't see me. Please don't see me. Please don't see me, I whispered. Hey! Button nose booger! Then he started walking over to our truck. My arms fell to my sides, and I felt Tammy grab the Slurpee to keep it from spilling over. Hot balls of water welled up in the corners of my eyes. He was still walking toward me. A thud filled my ears, and a hand, and then a hand. Then I felt his hand on my bare arm, and he squeezed it so hard and deep. Dan, Tammy said to him, "What do you want?" I want Booger to say hi to me when I call her. I couldn't move. A tall, skinny kid from an old giant convertible was yelling at his girlfriend to hurry up. She started to move even slower. The stringy-haired boy threw a wad of keys at her and then dumped her purse out on the concrete. She started running toward the car full of kids, and the skinny kid called her a whore. My blood dad turned from me to them, then back to me. His girl still hadn't come out of the bathroom. You hear me, Boog? You don't have any manners. What is your mom teaching you? You have no manners at all. He squeezed my arm and yanked down so hard I fell to my knees. You are an embarrassment. You can't handle yourself. It sounded like the words were coming from his chest. He dragged me from the floor of the truck to the pavement. Now stand. Stand here. Stand nice. Stand like a nice girl. I saw Tammy slide over the side of the truck and go inside the store. I focused on his shoes. They were new and clean, and they had white soles, and there was no dirt or scuffs on the shoes, and the laces were brand new and crisp. The bell rang on the door, and my blood dad released the grip on my arm, and he turned and walked back to the truck like I'd vanished. He was shaking his head in disgust. His new girl was honking the horn on the truck and put her bare feet through the open passenger window. And I heard her yell, Come on, Ring! And he yelled back, Get your feet off the door! My dress was torn on the side where it got stuck on the corner of the truck gate. And I felt a trickle of blood move from my rib. From the rib, in my skin. It trickled down toward my hip, and I started walking slow toward the road. I needed to walk home. I wanted to hide. I saw Ring's truck move out of the back lot, and it went up toward the road. I was so full up of embarrassment. I couldn't face Mr. Saddle. I heard a small running sound, and then I felt Tammy's arm slip around my waist. Tammy's face was wet and red, and I knew I would lose my friend forever. I turned and reluctantly went back to the truck. The passenger door was open, and Mr. Saddle had a helpless, pained frown. He said no words. He just shut the truck door behind me. The ride home was empty of sound. The cicadas stopped their song and the sun fell behind a cloud. When I arrived home, my Aunt Mary was sitting on the front step. Mary was friends with Teak's sister, Emily. He must have called her. My Aunt Mary was 10 years older than me, so I just called her Mary, or Mary Mary, like the nursery rhyme. She had a quiet laughter and a warm, sad spirit. Most of the time, she was unnoticed and quietly doing nothing. She stood and took me from the truck. Her hand found my shoulder, and my head found her neck, and we didn't speak for a long time. We just sat and watched fireflies. 
I knew she wouldn't tell my mama. Mary wasn't one for talking. When I settled, I took Pony up the steps to my bed. I heard Mary close the back door, and then sleep gripped me and submerged me very deep. There are no real feelings in sleep, and for that, I am thankful. The end. Thank you. Rachel and Darlene, thank you so much. That was, I felt like I've been transported to worlds and lives um, far away, and I feel, I feel like I've communed with all of humanity after this, <laughs> this evening. The episodes have been personal and poignant, and uh, I just want to thank you both and recognize that our students are so lucky to have you as their teachers, clearly. Yeah. Produce. <laughs> Um, I will put out a call for, oh, I can take this off, sorry. I will put out a call for applications for the Bennett Writing Grant before spring break, and I encourage faculty from all departments to consider putting in an application. The 1959 Kingswood Yearbook was dedicated to Miss Bennett with this inscription. Miss Bennett, you have illuminated for us the great realm of literature from Moses to Mogum, our, confu our confused syntax and the confusing imagery of the modern poets have become clear under your teaching. Even when engulfed by book reports, critical papers, and clarion proofs, you always have an encouraging word or a bracing comment for us. To